Lord, good evening. Welcome to you all. Welcome into God's house. If you're visiting us, I give you a very warm welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus and trust that you'll be blessed as you meet with us this evening. We're going to uh, start our service by singing from our hymn book, uh, number 228, number 228. And uh, not only are we singing what we're doing, but we're doing what we're singing. We are uh, turning from the world, all the cares of the day, all the cares of life, just to spend this uh, precious time uh, with the Lord. So number 228, here from the world we turn, Jesus to seek. turn to a few verses in John's Gospel chapter 20 and as uh, much as I'm always tempted to on the week after Easter to preach on Thomas and to uh, prove to you all that he's not a doubter uh, instead this year I've just left it on my blog so you can read it and we're going to do something entirely uh, different but I do want to just use the words uh, of this passage to set the tone for our evening. So John chapter 20 and uh, verse uh, 21. And uh, Jesus has appeared to the disciples on the uh, evening of what we now call Easter Sunday. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless... I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. And he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here. And look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 
And that's true, of course, of every disciple of the Lord Jesus uh, who came after the apostolic era, who have put their trust in one that they have not seen. But we trust that he will be to us all that he has promised. Well, let's uh, take up some of those words for our second hymn, number 507. 507. O oh Lord, our God, how majestic is your name. 507. things that we've read and sung on our hearts and minds let's come to God in prayer shall we let's all pray and heavenly father we do come this evening into your house with praise on our lips and praise in our hearts as we have just sung you are the Lord our God and we think back to those words that Thomas echoed all those years ago uh, on this very night when he said to you, my Lord and my God. And in that moment, all his worries had disappeared, all his uh, feelings that it was impossible for the Lord Jesus to have risen again, uh, they all vanished in that single moment when you proved to him that you were both Lord and God. You were raised from the dead and you are alive forevermore. And so he could kneel down and declare that you were his Lord and his God and we can do the same this evening and Lord we have come to do the same this evening not perhaps in the same circumstances but as we read your word and as we sing your praise we come to you this evening and we declare that you are indeed my Lord and my God and we thank you for the privilege that 
that it is to be able to say that. We're not your children because we're religious or because we're good, uh, but we are sinners who are saved by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. We are people who are raised with him because he lives, we shall live also. So we thank you once again and we would not uh, very easily put out of our minds the wonderful story of Easter that we've looked at over this last week or two. It is a truly wonderful thing that you have done for us, mm-hmm. that you would send your son. Uh, as we were hearing this morning, he left the glory of heaven and in humility became a man. And he was tired and he was hungry uh, and he was cross and all of those things that we feel he felt and he was tempted as we are uh, in all points yet he didn't sin he proves that he was perfect he proves that he was both lord and god he proved he was the perfect man the second adam and he proved that he was god the son the divine one the one in whom you were well pleased <coughs> and yet he allowed wicked men to take him and nail him to a cross. And he didn't do that because it was a tragic accident. He did that because he had agreed a covenant with the Father all those years ago, before time began, that he would come and save sinners. And we are sinners and we need a saviour. And so tonight we bow down before you and we say, Lord Jesus, you are my Lord and my God. And we thank you for the privilege of being your children. Lord, we confess still that we are not the children that we ought to be. Once again, Lord, we come to you and we ask for you to uh, wash away our sins. We were singing this morning that your blood washes away our sins. And we thank you for that. Thank you seems such an inadequate phrase, but there isn't anything else that we have. But we do say thank you with all our hearts that our sins are not just washed away once, but they are continually washed away. And so we confess our sins and we ask that you would forgive us for this week's shortcomings of the things that we have said and done and thought that are not worthy of you. And we ask that you would forgive us for the things that we could have done that we didn't. Lord, we pray, help us week by week, day by day, to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ, to be conformed to his image, to live as he would like us to live. Help us to leave this place tonight being determined to follow and worship such a great Saviour who has purchased us with his blood. Lord, we pray for ourselves. We pray for our needs. We thank you that you care for us. We thank you that you love us, that you are interested in every point of our lives. We thank you for answered prayer. Uh, We thank you that little Thomas is with us. We thank you that Ezra is home. We thank you that those who have been unwell have been back to see us, and we thank you for that. But Lord, we continue to pray for those who need a touch of your hand, and we ask that in your mercy you would touch uh, bodies and minds, uh, that you would heal those who need that uh, touch from you. We ask that you'd help us to uh, continually be in prayer for one another, uh, to look out for one another, to see if we can help one another, uh, particularly for those in need. We pray, Lord, for those whom we know who are not yet yours. And we long to see people saved, Heavenly Father. We long to see our husbands and wives and our children and our brothers and our sisters. Each one of us has people that we know and love dearly who we would love to see in the kingdom. We pray, Lord, this evening once again for them. We prayed for them on our own, perhaps many times, but together we come and we ask uh, that you would have mercy upon those who are lost. Pray for the town or the city rather of Colchester, particularly the area that you've placed us. We pray for those who live around about this building, up and down the streets, Lord. We pray for each one that you would have mercy upon them. Lord, you know everyone, uh, every single person who lives in every single house. You know all about them. You know their needs, you know their situation in life, but above all, you know that they need the Lord Jesus to be their saviour. Help us to witness, help us to be a good witness to you. But Lord, may you do that which only you can. May you save those uh, who are around this place. May they come into this church or maybe another church and hear your word faithfully preached and be born again, we pray. Pray for our nation. 
You've told us to pray for those who rule over us. We pray for our king. We pray for our royal family. We pray that once again you would touch them because we know that there are those who are poorly and they really need your, uh, your help. And we pray that they would turn to you for that help. We pray that they would seek themselves uh, the Lord's forgiveness and the Lord's mercy and the Lord's healing power. We pray for all of those who don't yet know you that you would turn their hearts to you. We pray for our MPs and we pray for those who sit in the House of Lords and we thank you that we believe that there are a number who love the Lord and we, we know in particular of one who has recently stood up and unashamedly talked about the meaning of Easter and the Gospel of the Lord Jesus. We pray for these people that they would have an influence for good. Uh, we've read recently that the Council of Churches of Europe have written to the European Commissioner saying that the Christian uh, laws which shaped Europe are now being marginalised and asking uh, that, their, that the Christian gospel would be considered by lawmakers. We thank you for their bravery. We thank you for that letter and pray that it would do good. We pray that those who are responsible for making laws would turn to you for their wisdom. Lord, we pray, have mercy <laughs> upon our nation and upon our world. We pray for those areas which are war-torn. We ask that there would be peace. We have no idea, humanly speaking, how this can come about because we see men at their worst when war happens. But we pray for peace. We pray for a cessation of hostilities. And above all, we pray for free course for the gospel to go through in all of these situations. We pray for the persecuted. And we know that there are many countries, many situations in many countries, even those who would call themselves sympathetic to the gospel, where your word is suppressed, where your people are hurt. Lord, we pray, have mercy. Bless your people, help your people who are suffering. And may their, their tormentors come <coughs> to know you as Saviour and Lord for themselves. So Lord, we, we ask much of you. We thank you that you hear our prayers. We thank you that you're well able to answer all of our prayers. And so we thank you once again for your mercy and your kindness and your love for us. Thank you that we're your children. And we ask this evening that you would speak to us now as we read your word. Bless it to us, we pray. <coughs> May it not be an ac academic exercise. May this be something which stirs us up. May this be a living word to us, that we may be moved and changed by what we read and hear. So bless your word to us, we pray. We ask all of these things with great thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, can I invite you to turn to the letter of uh, Galatians and uh, we're going to read chapter 2 uh, but I uh, need to tell you that uh, chapter 1 wasn't recorded so Elijah has given me licence to uh, preach chapter 1 first uh, before we go on to the next, uh, next sermon just kidding but um, we, if you do want the headings for that we can look at that later so Galatians in chapter 2 and uh, it's a continuation of, of the uh, argument I suppose you would call it of chapter 1 Chapter 1 and chapter 2, Paul is really speaking about the gospel's origination. How did we get the gospel? How did it come to us? How did it kind of move from this you know, man dying in Galilee to this worldwide church that we have now? How did the Galatians hear about it? And how do we know it's the true gospel? Uh, some of us this week have been talking to people who believe a, a different gospel. And the question is, well, how do we know that what you're preaching is the truth? Well, because what we're preaching is in the scriptures. And if it's not in the scriptures, then you're to disregard it. It has to be completely based on what the Bible says. And so Galatians in chapter 2 is the second half or the second part of this uh, conversation that Paul is really having with the churches in Galatia. Uh, it's not one church, as I think we mentioned last time. It's uh, to a whole series of churches, both in the south and in the north uh, of Galatia. And so... Chapter 2, verse 1, uh, we read this. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, 
that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission, even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me, God shows personal favouritism to no man. For those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also prayed the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Pray that God will help us to understand that word this evening as we consider that in a moment. Well, before we do, let's sing number 525. Uh, 525. Uh, o thou who camest from above. Uh, a prayer really that as we read God's word together, that our hearts would be strangely warmed as they were uh, on that day on the road to Emmaus all those years ago. 525. Will my 
faith and love repeats till death I endless mercy seal and make the sacrifice to have a second look at this um, this book, uh, the one that Luther called his Katie, uh, that he loved this book, it was, uh, we often associate Luther with Romans, um, but uh, Galatians was uh, a particular favourite of uh, Martin Luther because it helped him to understand uh, that he didn't need to try and keep uh, laws, uh, whether it be of the Pope or whether it be of any other sort of laws, uh, the Gospel is that Jesus Christ uh, died for sinners and if we put our trust in him uh, then we are saved but this book uh, is about or certainly the early parts of this book uh, is about Paul's uh, we might call it a quarrel with the churches of Galatia and uh, we looked at that in uh, verses uh, 6 to 10 I marvel he says that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. There were those who were coming in and saying, the gospel that Paul preaches is not enough. It's not really the whole gospel. And uh, in addition to that, they also um, occupied the, uh, the great uh, technique of if you can't uh, rubbish the message, well, have a go at rubbishing the messenger. Uh, they would say, well, Paul... He isn't really an apostle. He wasn't one of the twelve. He didn't go around with the Lord Jesus. So what's he doing calling himself an apostle? He's a guy who's kind of tagged on, you know, some years later. And so Paul uh, begins to do two things in chapter 1 and chapter 2. First of all, he says that he was an apostle, uh, equal authority with the other apostles, and his message was the truth. Uh, and so these are the claims uh, that he makes and he begins to make those in chapter one and he carries on with those uh, in chapter two uh, and so the, the the problem is that there were jewish people who uh, may or may not have been genuine christians but let's just assume that they were let's be charitable uh, and uh, they were coming along saying well you know the gospel really is for jewish people and and it's a jewish thing Okay, so as the message of the Old Testament, as, as we would call it, clearly they wouldn't call it that, but they would say their scriptures are saying that the gospel is for the Jewish people. Now, we don't mind a few Gentiles coming in as long as they embrace the Jewish way of life. Okay, so this is the argument. Uh, and of course, Paul is saying, no, that doesn't work anymore. Uh, something has changed. And so my first heading for you this evening is that Paul is saying uh, in verses 1 to 6 of chapter 2 is that there must be one gospel. There must be one gospel. And in part of, of Paul's kind of argument explaining how he became an apostle, how he became to be commissioned in this way, uh, he's giving his kind of life story. Uh, and uh, you'll know, of course, that he became a Christian uh, fairly soon after the Lord Jesus rose again, um, we read of him, um, first of all, as this proud Jewish man uh, standing by, listening uh, to Stephen preaching and watching Stephen being stoned to death at the first martyr of the church. He was there then. He was a young man then, we read. Um, but it's not long after that he uh, gets a bit zealous and joins in with all the persecution. As far as we know, he doesn't stone Stephen. But soon after that, well, Paul kind of gets up and says, right, well, let's go out and, and duff as many Christians up as we can. Let's get them arrested. Let's get them beaten. Let's get them put in prison. And he developed a real hatred for uh, the Christian <coughs> church. But then we know of his experience on the Damascus Road. Uh, he, was, uh, he was saved. He met uh, the Lord Jesus. And he, he refers to that. In chapter 1 verse 15 when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles and so we know Paul uh, you know, goes to Damascus and he immediately starts to preach 
and the Damascus are going, hang on a minute, we thought you were coming to kill the Christians, now you're one of them, and they get the ump, and they want to kill him, so he's let down through, uh, on, a bas- on a basket through the wall, and he escapes. And then he says, after three years, I went to Jerusalem, this is 1 verse 18, to see Peter, and kind of just had a, a, a conversation uh, with him, and also James, the Lord's brother, who by now has replaced James, the apostle, and has become effectively the leader of the Jewish church. And then he says in chapter 2, verse 1, 14 years after that, uh, I went up again to Jerusalem. So there's been this quite quiet period for Paul. It's 14 years on top of the other three. And uh, he's in Antioch. And no doubt he's witnessing and living his life, making tents and, and so on. But, you know, learning the gospel, uh, believing the gospel, seeing how it's all fulfilled in the Old Testament and so on. And uh, God, when he saved him, the Lord Jesus, when he appeared to him, he said, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. Well, of course, for a Jewish person, that was just about the worst job that you could possibly get. But uh, he says, well, 17 years then after being converted, the first three years, and I've just mentioned and now another 14, uh, I went up to Jerusalem. And I needed to just check that the gospel that I was preaching is the same gospel that they are preaching. Uh, And so he goes to see the leaders, and it consists consists of Peter, who is called Cephas in our reading, uh, which is his Jewish name, James, the Lord's brother, and John, the apostle. And Paul tells them what he's been preaching, and uh, he's also told them what God has done through his preaching. Now, Paul hasn't been sent on any missionary journeys at this stage. Uh, That comes shortly afterwards, but uh, he has been uh, explaining what he's done. And of course, he, he does that full well, uh, knowing full well that Peter has already had an encounter with Gentile people, hasn't he? You remember the story? Peter has gone, uh, has been called to the house of Cornelius. Well, Cornelius was a Roman soldier. And what did Peter do that was so terrible? Well, he went into his house and he preached to them and then he ate and drank with them. And that's something that Jewish people didn't do. And so he's breaking the, the rules of Jewish uh, etiquette. He goes back to Jerusalem and explains what's going on and he gets criticized very sharply. Why have you done this? You went into Gentiles and you ate with them. (coughs) And so he explains all that's happened. And he says, well, this is what happened and who was I to stand in the way of what God did? And so the council of Jerusalem, or sorry, not the council of Jerusalem, the the meeting in Jerusalem uh, that that he reports to uh, agreed, well, okay, the, the Lord has opened the door to Gentiles also. But their understanding at this point is exactly as it had always been in the Old Testament, in the time, from the time of Moses through David and, and so on, all the way through the prophets and up till now. And that is, you can join us uh, as Gentiles. Gentiles can join us, but we're the church. The Jewish people are the church. And Paul is saying, you know, that isn't true anymore. And so for the Jewish believers, of course, this was a massive problem, wasn't it? You know, they've, they've been used to being the special people of God. No other nation could ever call themselves the people of God. They were the people of Jehovah. They were his special people. And they didn't mind Gentiles coming in as long as they, they kept their status as top dog. So the questions now come thick and fast for these uh, Jewish believers. Um, have, have they lost this status as God's special people. Uh, what about Jewish customs? You know, what about the, the, you know, the washings that we do and uh, the feasts that we have and, and the, the things that we wear? And, you know, what, what, what about all of those? You know, what do we make the Gentiles do? And what do we do if they don't do them? What about <coughs> eating with Gentiles? I mean, we don't eat with them. <laughs> you know, if we wanted to, can we? Do we? Uh, you know, you can see their, their dilemma. This has been 1,300 years of living as a distinct people of God. They've been the unrivaled people. uh, And outside Israel, they were counted, as Paul says, although I imagine he's saying it rather ironically, that they are sinners of the Gentiles. That's that's what they were. The Gentiles is a a derogatory name. It's not a nice, polite name. It's a derogatory name. You know, Gentiles uh, were pagans. They were ignorant. They were blasphemers. They were immoral people. We, we might, you know, using our class system in Britain, we might say, well, they're peasants. You know, these are second class people. You know, these are lower than us. And 
God speaks regularly about judging the Gentiles. We get that. You know, Gentiles are ripe for judgment. That's really all they're for. And a classic example of Gentiles, of course, was the very Roman Empire that they were part of. You know, Rome was uh, a wicked empire. It was utterly brutal. It was full of gross immorality. It had the slave system with all of the horrendous things that that brought. Uh, and their leaders were corrupt. Uh, the whole way that the Caesars went about things and the Praetorian Guard went about things and the Senate went about things it was completely corrupt. And so the Jews would look at Gentiles and go, well, yeah, that's Gentiles. That's what they do. That's what they're like. Well, maybe there's the odd good one. Uh, you know, Cornelius, for example. Well, okay, if they abandon their, their Gentileness and become Jews, that's fine. But what the Galatians had a real problem with, and what the people who were going into Galatia after Paul had gone was teaching them was that, Paul, you cannot be serious. So we were talking about this great phrase. If you're of a certain age and know of a certain tennis player, you'll hear that phrase uh, you know, quite a lot. You, know, you cannot be serious. Are you really saying that these people are now equal with us? Are you saying, Paul, that the Gentiles, whom we have legitimately despised for 1,300 years, are now going to be equal with us? that they are part of the same kingdom that we are. And the answer that the Galatians came to was, you cannot be right and you cannot be from God. But uh, Paul is saying, no, the, the teaching that I'm bringing you is that the Gentiles and the Jews are one in Christ Jesus. They are equal in Christ Jesus. And of course, for the Gentiles, this is great news, isn't it? So the first heading then is that there is one gospel. There is one gospel and it's the same gospel for the Jewish people as it is for the Gentile people. And the second thing, because Paul is very being very controversial here, I mean we've, we've kind of lost sight of the, the controversy and the, the, uh, the amazement that these people had because we're used to it. But for Paul's readers and for Paul's pe people who, who Paul would preach to, they would, were astounded by this. But then we have, secondly, Paul is uh, authenticated because in verses 7 to 10, uh, he tells us uh, what happened. And so he's gone to Jerusalem and he's spoken to Peter and James and John and he said, this is what I have been preaching. And his message is authenticated because it says, on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcision had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. In other words, the gospel to the Gentiles was what I'm preaching. The gospel, gospel to the Jews is what they are preaching. Uh, he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me for the Gentiles. So we've got two people there in charge. Peter, you're in charge of preaching the gospel to the Jews. I, Paul, am in charge of the gospel to the Gentiles. And it says, when James and Cephas and John, who were the pillars of the church, the leaders of the church, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. In other words, they said, we are one. We agree with what you're doing. We agree with what you're saying. And then, of course, we have the council that was called in Acts chapter 15. Uh, now, this is... Uh, by now, this has become a big problem in the church. At the moment, still, the, the vast majority of, of Christians are, are Jewish people, certainly as far as Jerusalem is concerned. But now they're hearing reports that Paul is going out all over the place. People are becoming Christians all over the place. You've got Barnabas doing his thing. You've got Apollos doing his thing. Well, hang on a minute. We need to nail this down. And so if you read in Acts 15, you can have a look at that when you get home. Uh, Paul appears before this council and he explains that, uh, you know, it isn't just a question now of the church being mainly Jewish and allowing a few Gentiles in as long as you behave. This is now a situation where the Jewish people, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians are exactly the same. They are exactly the same before God. They come to God in exactly the same way. And he gives what to us might seem a slightly trivial example earlier on in verses 1 to 6, where he says, you know, we took Titus with us. Now, this was a bit of a ticking time bomb because, as you'll know from Paul's um, uh, escapades in the book of Acts, towards the end of the book of Acts, you know, this caused a riot uh, when, he, when he turned up in, in Jerusalem to, uh, uh, to kind of go through one of the feasts. There was a riot because he brought Greek. But here he brings this Greek man. 
What's the, what's the big deal here? Well, he wasn't circumcised. In other words, he hadn't submitted himself to the Jewish rites and customs. Theoretically, he should be put out. Theoretically, he couldn't come into the church. Theoretically, he couldn't be any part of us. But he said, we brought him with us. And we said, this is Titus. And he is equal with us. And the apostles in Jerusalem agree. And so Paul says, I have preached to you one gospel. It is the same gospel that the Jewish people of Paul, of Peter rather, and Cephas and John have preached. So the gospel is the same. It's to be received the same. It's both for Jews and for Gentiles. And there's no distinction between Jewish people and Gentile people. We don't have to obey the law. Uh, we don't have to live uh, in that way any longer. Uh, it is now all by grace. And so we have this victory for Paul. He is preaching the same gospel, but he's preaching it to the Gentiles. And he's saying you must be justified by faith in Jesus Christ. And after all of this argument and all of this kind of lots of hot air have gone back and forward, eventually everyone agrees, yes, we see that's the way it is. But Jewish believers and Gentile believers are one in Christ Jesus. However, there is still a problem. And the problem is that the Jewish people were still congregating together and the Gentiles uh, were kind of congregating on their, on their uh, you know, on the other side, as it were. So if we were having a situation here, then perhaps we might expect the Jewish people to sit on this side and the Gentile people to sit on that side, you know, because we, we're not really going to get too close, all right? And we're not going to, you, know, um, you know, get too cosy. And so we have this problem we see in verses 11 to 16. And we have this remarkable account of Paul standing up to the great Peter, this uh, big burly fisherman who no doubt could have squashed him with one hand, because as you know, Paul is a nickname. It's not his real name. Uh, his real name is Saul. Uh, but they gave him the nickname Paul because he was little. And Paul means little. And so you've got little Paul standing up to big burly P Peter who can haul a net of 400 fish in all on his own. And he says to him, Peter, you are playing the hypocrite. You're playing the hypocrite. What was Peter doing? Well, before, uh, when Peter first came to Antioch, he was happy to sit and have a meal with anyone. He could sit with the Gentiles, he could sit with the Jews. It's no problem, we all sat together. But then some people came from Jerusalem. They'd been sent by James, uh, no doubt to encourage the church at Antioch, which by now uh, had become a big church. It was called Queen of the East. And... Uh, uh, it was the centre, really, of um, Gentile Christianity. And so James sent some emissaries along to find out what was going on, perhaps encouraged them, and so on. And what does Peter do? The moment the Jewish people turn up, he goes, oh, can't eat with the Gentiles. And he went and sat with the Jewish people and ignored the Gentiles. And Paul is saying, you're making the problem, uh, turn, you know, you're turning the clock back, you're making the problem that we thought we'd sorted out, you're making it a problem again. Because if we're all one in Christ Jesus, then the Jewish laws don't count anymore. We can eat with the Gentiles. We can do all of the things that they do. And we may choose to keep our own customs and we may choose to, to do various things that they don't do. But you cannot live like that. You cannot live as if you know, you're a Jew one minute and a Gentile the next minute. There is no difference. And so the problem had now become more human, if you like, rather than theological. Uh, and, and Peter had to learn uh, this rather sharp lesson. And the lesson was that it isn't just enough to say that we all have the same gospel and we can all come the same way. You've got to live it. You've actually got to live with these Gentiles. You've got to love Gentiles. And of course, this for the Jews is, is, is extraordinary. It's a bridge too far for a lot of them. And so Paul says there is one gospel. Uh, there is, uh, and he was authenticated in that. Um, Paul sees the problem, and the problem is that the Jewish people were not embracing and loving the Gentiles as they should. And so, fourthly, as we've said, Paul stands up to Peter and calls him a hypocrite, calls him a coward. And, uh, you know, he basically says, you cannot live like that. And then the fifth heading in verses 16 to 18 is that ritual cannot save anyone. 
This is the bottom line, really. What is the lesson? Jews can be Jewish. If Jewish people want to keep their culture and live in the way that they've always lived, that's fine. Uh, when some of you were here this morning and were hearing uh, Hass uh, preach, he uh, spoke to us at the men's breakfast last, uh, last week or so ago. And one of the things that he said, which I thought was very interesting, is that a lot of Muslim people um, kind of think of themselves as Muslim much more because of their culture. Uh, they are kind of cultural Muslims, um, rather than kind of people doing some of the extreme things that we read and hear of on our, our media. Uh, a lot of people would say, well, I'm a Muslim because I was born a Muslim. And, and this is the way that the Jewish people were. Well, I'm Jewish because I was born Jewish. I'm Jewish because, you know, I'm, I'm being set aside in this way. But what Paul is saying, and what Peter no doubt was saying as well, is that this can't save you. Being a Jew can't save you. It never could, actually, but it certainly can't now. And so Gentiles will live as Gentiles live. And if you want to keep uh, the Jewish people, if you want to keep your laws, and if you want to dress in your way, and if you want to read in, in Hebrew or Aramaic or whatever, that's fine. But you need to understand that this distinction doesn't matter anymore. The barrier has come down. Christ Jesus has taken it down. Christians are all equal to their Christian brothers. The barriers that separated Jews and Gentiles is now been taken down. It's gone. The law is fulfilled. Jesus has died to fulfill all of the sacrifices. The sacrifices aren't relevant anymore. They've all been done away with because Christ has fulfilled them. Uh, the civil law, okay, that does apply to Jewish people, but it doesn't apply anywhere else. The only thing that remains is what we would call the moral law, what we're known as the Ten Commandments. They're still binding on all men. How are, they, how are they binding on all men? Well, because they're the moral code that God gives us to live by. They're the standard. They are the Ten Commandments from which government should make their laws. They are the laws that we, we should uh, live our lives by. Not that that can save us, of course, because we will never keep the law perfectly. That's why Christ came in the first place. But it is uh, designed to show us our need for a saviour. And so Paul says, as Jews, our history is now complete. Our function is complete. What was the job of the Jewish people? It was to uh, explain the law to the world. What was the other job of the Jewish people? To bring the Messiah into the world. They'd have done that. And so nowadays, the whole, the whole point of having a Jewish identity in terms of being a better Christian or a better person or more holy or more favoured by God, that's all gone. And unfortunately, there are still many people who still feel that the Jews have got some extra special status. But Paul says in Galatians, that simply isn't the case. There is now no difference. And he says in verse uh, 17, quite strongly, he says, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, um, sorry, is that the right verse? Um, yeah. if, we, if we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are all found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law. You see, the reason that being a Jew doesn't matter anymore is because the, the, the law can't save you. The moral law can't save you because you can't keep it. The sacrificial law can't save you because it's not enough. And so this whole point about being a special person if you're Jewish doesn't count for anything and if you try and keep hold of that jewishness if you kind of treat and, and, and keep saying well I'm, I'm going to worship god in this way you're building what christ has, has dismantled and so you are doing insult uh, to god jesus has wiped the slate clean period he hasn't wiped the slate clean so you can start again because you could never be saved by the works of the law and so Paul is saying in these opening chapter to two chapters to Galatians, you've got to let the old ways go. You've got to let that way of thinking go. Christ has not disregarded the law or replaced the law. He has fulfilled it. It's now obsolete. The law cannot save you. The, cer the ceremonial law can't save you. Jesus saves you. And so, yes, the moral law is something we need to, uh, to use. But we don't need any of the law more than the butterfly needs the cocoon from which it hatched from. It's now 
they're done, it's spent, it's over. And then we have what we might uh, call the crux of the matter in chapter 2, verses 20 to 21. So how do we know all of this? How do we know that Paul is really right when he says this? How do we know that uh, the Jewish law is finished with, that it's complete, that it's done, it's fulfilled, and we don't come to God through that way? Well, because verse 20 and 21 tells us how we do come and how we do live. You see, when we accept Christ, we understand that everything we are and everything we have tried to do to get right with God is futile. And of course, it isn't just Jewish people that have tried to get right with God by keeping the law, is it? There are Gentile people who also try and get right with God by doing good works, by being good people. And there are many in our society who do that as well, aren't there? But as the preacher says, it's all vanity. It's all grasping for the wind. It doesn't matter what you try and build in this life, it will never be enough. And so the law, all it can do, all it could ever do, and it does it to both Jews and Gentiles, is it condemns me. And it tells me that I'm spiritually dead. It tells me that I'm under the sentence of eternal death. It tells me that I can't do anything to save myself any more than a dead person can get up and start walking. We are spiritually dead. But Jesus has saved us. In verse 20, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. When you became a Christian, what that means is you identified with Christ's death. You understood that his dying was in your place. That's what that phrase means. I am crucified with Christ. I'm just as dead, or I was just as dead, as he was. But I live. It is not uh, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. See, I was dead, but now I'm alive. And I was dead in my trespasses and sins, but now I'm alive because Jesus has made me alive. Because he has died for me. He has saved me. He's completed the law on my behalf. And he has satisfied his demands for my death by dying for me. So Jesus lived a perfect life that I didn't live. And he died the death that I should die. I am crucified with Christ. When he died, my punishment was put upon him. That's why, and then that's the way I am crucified. With him, I was condemned. I have no hope of escape any more than Jesus could not come down from that cross because he decided that he would stay there uh, for us. But now I live. So how am I going to live the life that I live? Whether I'm a Jew, whether I'm a Gentile, how am I going to do that? Paul says, well, what you're going to do and what I'm going to do, he says, is I'm going to live by faith in the Son of God. I'm going to live for him. My whole life is going to be geared about, about living for him. My whole focus is going to be on pleasing him. My whole life is going to be about asking myself, what does he want me to do? You know, that was the first question Paul asked, wasn't it? Lord, what would you have me to do? That's the question that we should be asking all the time. Lord, what do you want me to do? Am I going to go back to those old ways? As a Jew, am I going to go back to the law and start trying to live by the law which condemns me that's ridiculous isn't it if I'm a Gentile am I going to go back to my old pagan practices and idolatry and sacrifices and all the things that they did that'd be ridiculous wouldn't it it doesn't save it condemns so why would you go back and do those things no he says I'm going to live for Christ and I'm going to live for Christ by faith I am going to be effectively a living sacrifice Every day, I'm going to give myself to the Lord Jesus. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. That's how we march to Zion, isn't it? By putting our faith in the Son of God. If it's not irreverent, we actually put our hands in his hand and we say, I'll walk with you. You lead me on. Wherever you lead me, I will go. I was trying to live my life, getting into God's good books by being good, by being religious. That's what Paul's life was. And there are plenty of people who make that mistake today. But Paul says, no, the answer is to say, I have been crucified with him. I am dead to myself and I live 
for him. And I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That phrase is just incredible, isn't it? The Son of God who loved me gave himself for me. Can you say that this evening? The Son of God loved you, gave himself for you. And so as we close chapter 2, we might say, well, what does that really mean for us? We're not Jews. We're not really part of this Jewish-Gentile argument. I mean, that's finished a long time ago. So how is this chapter relevant to us? The first thing I'd like you to take home tonight from this chapter is the love of God. You see, God does all of this because he loved us. We were hearing a bit about that this morning, weren't we? God doesn't need us. God doesn't uh, look at us and go, well, these are good people. Well, we need to do something for them. That's not the question at all. God loves us because he loves us. And we cannot ever understand that. And the more we, we go along the Christian road, the, probably the less we understand it. How can God love me? With all my sin and with all my weakness, and with all my pride and with all my arrogance, how can he love me? Well, he does. And, and he says to us, I want you to call me Father. I'm not some distant, faraway God who is so stern and unloving and, you know, sort of starchy. I'm, I'm one you can call Abba. Literally, that means dad. It's incredible, isn't it? And not that, that that diminishes our reverence for God one iota. It mustn't. But it shows us his love and his grace and his mercy. God loves the world. How do we know he loved the world? Because he sent his son. So this chapter talks about God's love for us. The second thing he talks about is crucifixion. The question is, are you crucified with Christ this evening? Now, you might say, well, what does that really mean? Well, what it means is that you have come to a point in your life where you're saying, I cannot possibly earn my salvation. I cannot possibly be good enough for God. I cannot possibly undo the things that I've done, which will keep me out of heaven, and I can't pay for them. I can't make it right. So I'm in a situation where I am lost. And if I die like this, I will be eternally lost. But being crucified with Christ means that I recognise that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who lived a perfect life and died on the cross for sinners, to pay for their sins, to pay for my sins. And so by coming to him and asking him to forgive me for my sins, I am saying I am crucified with you. I am dead to myself, I am dead to my old life and I now live for you. Are we a people who are determined by his grace to go out from this place this evening and live for the Lord Jesus Christ? Is, is anything else more important? Because it shouldn't be, should it? Because everything else that we have in this world, even the greatest and most wonderful things that we treasure, they will come to a close. But the love of Jesus will never come mm. to a close. And the third lesson from this chapter is that of partiality. You see, we can be the same as the Jewish people of old, can't we? We can look down on other people. And that's a, a temptation in every church. And we need to remember that whether we're rich or poor or strong or educated or not educated, whether we're popular or not popular, no one here is worth more than anybody else. We're all one. We're all on the same level. How do we know that? We're all loved the same. How do we know that? We all cost the same. Didn't we? We all cost the same price. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're all one. We're all on a level. And no one is better than anybody else. Even if you've been a Christian for 50 years or something, you're no better than the one who's just become a Christian. You are the same. We are all equally loved in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Let there be no partiality in the church. And then the last thing is, are we living by faith? What does that mean? What does it mean to live by faith? Well, we live by faith when we are saying to God, everything I am and everything I have is yours. There's, there's a hymn, isn't there? You know, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days let them flow in ceaseless praise. And it talks about taking our silver and our gold and our talents and everything that we have. That's living by faith. A daily attitude of saying to the Lord, I am yours. 
I will go where you send me, I will do what you ask of me. And I will do it with reverence and in humility and in love. So let's be those people who are living by faith. Let's be those people who uh, honour God in every little decision as well as in every big decision. Galatians chapter 2, one gospel, one people, equally loved, equally saved, <coughs> all to live for him. Amen. Amen. Let's close by singing number 795. Now, I don't know how many of you know this one. Um, I know two or three of us do, so it uh, might be a duet, but um, it's, it reminds us uh, that the Lord Jesus uh, really did lay aside everything uh, for us. And, uh, I think it's a lovely hymn to finish with. We'll sing it through twice if we may. Seven, nine, five. Seven, nine, five. Virtually the last one in the book. Gave up everything for me, suffered at the hands those you had created. You took all my guilt and shame when you died and rose again. Now today you reign in heaven and earth exalted. I really want to worship you, my Lord. You have won my heart and I am yours. Forever and ever, I will love you. You are the only one who died for me, gave your life to set me free. So I lift my voice to you. Adoration. You laid aside your majesty, gave up everything for me, suffered at the hands of those you had created. You took all my guilt and shame when you died and Today you reign, heaven and earth exalted. I really want to worship you, my Lord. You have won my heart and I am yours. Forever and ever, I will love you. You are the only one who died for me, gave your life to save. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.